Thank you, Bethany. That was awesome. And Nicole as well. Welcome, everyone. Oh, you can do better than that. Come on. Welcome, everyone. There we go. There we go. Good morning. Uh, and welcome, everybody uh, watching as well online. Uh, this morning, we're having our Celebration Sunday. It's Celebration Sunday. So this is the time where we really get the time to check out what is God doing in our midst. And we're going to be celebrating offering communion. I was just thinking about the fields as we're thinking of celebrating offering. And Rick's going to give a kind of a message on that and just just to see God's heart right we see the, all these fields being cleared right and, and the harvest coming in right God just blesses us so much so we want to celebrate these things today and it's going to be extended time in some prayer as well and also uh, then Jerry will be closing uh, this morning and uh, closing us in prayer and we're just going to take some extra conscious time of prayer this morning as well um, recap the marriage conference how many of you were at the marriage conferences right Good stuff, right? I mean, just phenomenal. I'm telling you, I was like, I told my wife, I said, man, we, next time they're speaking anywhere, I want to go see Roger and Joanne. They were such a blessing to us, and uh, if you missed it, uh, you missed it. I mean, you really missed it. Uh, it was so good. Um, Connect groups will not be meeting this week. There is one, uh, the Huskies and Stralos group will be meeting uh, this week as still, and um, church chat next week. So if you've been hanging out here, new, you haven't really gotten connected, you're still trying to figure out what is this Riverwood place really about, that's a great opportunity, and Brad will be doing that right following the service on Sunday, next Sunday. Uh, also, the 14th, uh, it's going to be our Global Outreach Sunday, and uh, Katrina Hasbrook, uh, David and Katrina Hasbrook, uh, missionaries from Spain who we support, they will be here, and they'll be speaking on Sunday, and we're going to have a meal following, so it'll be a great opportunity to uh, connect with them as well. Uh, outside of that, just check your bulletins. There's more things on your bulletins. And um, I just want to pray for us before we get started this morning. Dear God, we just thank you so much for all you do. Lord, continue to shower us with your love, your mercy, and your grace. Lord, I pray that you uh, would continue to be with uh, Larry and Anna as they're still just, just recovering out of the, the COVID. And Lord, we thank you for the healing that has been happening, Lord. And so we look forward to having them back very shortly here. And uh, Lord, uh, thank you so much for, for that continued health uh, for Anna. Lord, uh, just I pray that you would just bless this day, bless this service. This is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Was anyone outside yesterday? Anybody? No? No? So yesterday, the air was really chilly, but the sun was like completely unhindered from the clouds. It was shining so bright, and if you went outside and the sun hit you just right, it was like a warm blanket. And it made me think of this song that my dad uh, used to sing me when I was a little kid, and it says, To come into your present, Lord, it feels like sunlight on my head. And so as we come into the presence of God today, um, embrace it like that warm sun that's, that gives you warmth and gives you that peace and that sense of joy. Would you stand with us as we sing this morning?
said amen. Oh, when all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord for his love never ends. And all the people said amen. And all the people said amen. dubbed the hall of faith or the superheroes of the faith. And the reason why these people who were not superhuman and they had lots of faults of themselves, people in the hall of faith, there was a prostitute, a murderer, adulterer, and a coward. But they, they're in the hall of faith because they believe that God was who he says he is and they believe that God was able to do what he said he would do.
may be seated. Kids can go off the kids' lives. Good morning. Uh, I have to uh, say kudos, too, on the uh, marriage conference we had Friday night and Saturday. That was uh, an awesome, awesome thing. It was a, a free thing that our church did, and, and just trying to, uh, just, I guess we talked about it being a tune-up, but it was, it was a great, great uh, conference, so thank everybody that put that on. So what if we were a little bit more preoccupied with others rather than being preoccupied with ourselves. Think about it. When are we the happiest? When we're giving and when we're serving. God makes us, giving makes us who you want, who we were born to be. So why does the Bible talk so much about giving in Scripture? I mean, God doesn't need our money. Our church doesn't need our money. I think what our church need is a bunch of sold-out believers here. Our church needs leaders to be servant leaders. And I think the church needs integrity. And I think we need to have an outward focus. But the Bible still talks so much about giving. I believe that the Bible talks about giving so much is that God is the ultimate giver. He's the biggest giver in the universe. Now, here's a radical thought. What if the reason that he asked us to give is to be more like him? I mean, think about it. He asks us to give to be more like him. Every time we give, we move a little bit more on that spectrum from being selfish to being selfless. Now, before I get uh, too far into giving, I want you to know that giving is not a salvation issue. God doesn't love a tither more than he loves a non-tither. I mean, this is not a salvation issue. But our Heavenly Father loves you, and he's crazy about you. I think giving is an obedience issue. Scripture tells us to give tithes and offerings unto the Lord. So why does the Bible talk about this so much? I think, first off, you know, everybody, I think pretty much everybody knows what a tithe is. It's 10%. Um, the, the tithe was defined as 10% of our first fruits or increases, and the increase is just basically our modern-day wages. Um, the Bible talks about giving the tenth to the storehouses, which means our local church, and there was two purposes in there. Uh, the first was to feed the wid widows and orphans, and the second was to provide for the Levites, which are our modern-day pastors. Now, the offering which is completely different than the tithe. This comes after the tithe and is freely given from our surplus after we have taken care of our house, household and we have done our tithe. Now, for many of us, 10% uh, is uh, way out of our comfort zone. But how about try this? How about 5% or 3% and just see what God does in your life? Uh, Corinthians 9-7 uh, says... Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I think giving is a reminder, at least for me, for owner, uh, who owns things. It's a reminder that God, I am the manager, God is the owner of everything. I think it's a form of praise and worship. I think giving can be somewhat of a spiritual warfare issue. But in the end, I believe that giving is an act of worship. Uh, Malachi 3, verses 6 through 12. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you. But you ask, how will we return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe to the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. 
test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. I believe this is the only time God ever says that. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be not enough room to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Among the, then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Now, we're not, I'm not uh, you know, promoting the prosperity doctrine. God is not an ATM where we give him a little bit and we just start taking out. But I believe that this is the only time that he says, test me in this and see what he does. Um, you know, and, you know, people talk about, well, this is a prosperity doctrine, but I think there's other blessings that can come out of this as well as we give and to learn to be givers like God. Uh, it can be less strife in our relationships, in our marriage, maybe, maybe less expenses. Maybe he does give us more income. I don't know. But how about this? What about a better relationship in, with God? I think that's probably our ultimate um, blessing out of giving. Um, I have found time and time again, obedience proceeds blessing. Again, obedience proceeds blessing. Well, this morning, uh, we are going to be passing the giving plate for the first time in about 18 months. Um, this is not... Uh, taking up a collection by the church, but it's rather the church uh, people giving their tithes and offerings. Um, so why do we use a collection plate? I think it's a very uh, important act of worship. Uh, I know we have all sorts of other ways to, to give. We can give electronically or, or through the banks and stuff, but I believe this is one way that we can actually show our obedience, I guess, to God. Uh, for some of us, this may be the test that we've been waiting for. But for all of us, this should be a time of worship. Uh, now I'd like to ask the ushers to come down forward, and they're going to pass the plate. And I'm going to say a, a grace first, or a blessing on this, and uh, then they'll pass out, pass out the uh, uh, offering plates. So, Lord, I thank you for this day. Um, I just thank you for the blessings that uh, you have shown this, this body over the last year. Um, we just, uh, time and time again, you just you come through. Uh, nothing that we deserve, but yet you're, you're faithful to us, and we just thank you for that. I just pray for the hearts of this congregation, um, and I just uh, thank you for your blessings. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Mm-hmm.
now this morning, we're going to have an opportunity to hear from another saint. We're thinking of it's all saints day tomorrow, technically, right? So here's one of our saints. We always think of them to be these holy, holy people, right? Of course, Becky is, right? She's being holy as we're all called to be holy as he is holy. And so um, we're going to have, you got that set? I think we're set. Good? No? There we go. Is that better? Okay. Right. <laughs> well, it is an absolute honor to be able to share with you what God has done in my life. Um, my name is Becky Gar, and my husband Josh and I have been coming here about a year, a little over a year. We have two daughters, Hannah's five and Elaine is three. And uh, um, what a beautiful song to lead into this because God has always been faithful even when I have not been. <laughs> um, so I have the privilege and the honor of sharing with you today what God has done in my life and the journey that he's brought me on. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit, not so much focusing on how I came to Christ, but how in the last 15 years Christ finally got me out of this spiritual stupor, this coma into an awakening of, of his love for me. Um, and that's kind of what I want to focus on. So a little background. Um, I grew up in a small town in Wisconsin in a church going home, but not a Christ-focused home. Um, I had two older brothers and um, was kind of a tomboy growing up and uh, had this picture of God as, you know, kind of this big, I don't know, big bad guy up there kind of watching what I'm doing. And my parents divorced when I was 14, and I, I stayed with my dad and brothers. And at that point in my life, I, I realized I was definitely broken. I was in need of something, and I couldn't figure out what it was, but I was very angry that this God we supposedly served um, every, every week um, couldn't keep my family together. Um, and uh, although my home was loving, it was definitely not affectionate. So throughout my life, I've struggled with the affectionate side of God, of God really truly loving me. Um, at my freshman year... You want me to switch? Okay. Is that better? Can okay, are we good? Can you hear me? Let me try it now. Oh, there we go. So that big thunder is kind of what God had to do to get my attention, <laughs> basically. <laughs> um, my freshman year of college is when I actually came to Christ. Um, it was, I was involved in Campus Crusade for Christ, um, looking for something, and God got my attention. It was very easy for me at that point to realize, yes, I was broken. Yes, I needed God. So it seemed very logical for me. Accepting Christ was, was, was not the big struggle, um, but the next 15 years <laughs> were the, was the big struggle. Um, uh, my freshman year of college, I joined the Army that summer, um, wanted to serve God and country, so I, I went that route. But I knew still at that point that I was missing something. It just, it felt, yeah, Christianity seemed great, but I felt like there had to be something more to that, and I couldn't quite understand or grasp emotionally what that was. Um, I just couldn't believe that God truly loved me, me. I knew that he loved us, he loved his people, he loved his creation, but me individually, personally, I didn't think that I was good enough. I was saved, I believe, at 19, but I wasn't experiencing something called freedom, freedom in Christ, and that is a very tricky thing. <laughs> and as typical in life, um, sometimes we have to go down a darker path in order for uh, God's light to really seem bright and to get our attention, and so my struggle, uh, it, it got worse from there. Um, I really started believing in lies that I was not good enough, that I was not worthy, and it wasn't until recently that God has started to get my attention and break me of those lies. So, you know, it's, it's very easy in our culture to drown ourselves in busyness and things that we think are going to fulfill that emptiness in our heart, but never really do. I was, I was very busy working through college in the Army Reserve, relationship after relationship, uh, trying to convince myself that I was whole, convince myself that um, whatever this longing was in my heart was being fulfilled, but I knew deep down it wasn't. But I was so desperate for love, I just couldn't define why or what that meant. I was desperate for a family that was not broken. 
Um, and so I married young out of college, um, looking for love, right? Trying to find this Christian man that would fulfill this deep desire in my heart. Well, for those of you who are married, you know that that doesn't work, right? Um, it's something deeper than that. So I married young, and I didn't understand what it was to discern someone's character. And the man that I married um, at 23 was a very angry, angry man. He was very emotionally abusive. He was very um, belittling, um, very manipulative, very, very angry. Um, but he was very smart. <laughs> and within the first couple years of our marriage, I had become sort of this shell of a person um, that I that I wanted to be, and I felt super stuck, just stuck in this marriage. I loved God. I thought I loved him, but I didn't know how to get out. I didn't know how to see past that, um, and he was, he was so smart. I remember, <laughs> um, you know, him having, you know, multiple affairs and just a lot of lies and manipulation, and it was always my fault, and he would always tell me, I'm not good enough. It was my fault. Things were were um, very dark, and I remember l crying myself to sleep many nights, wishing that he would just hit me so I could have a physical reason to leave, because I couldn't reconcile in my heart how I can love God, but leave this man that I supposedly committed my life to. But God puts people in your life at the right moments and the right times to wake you up, and that's what he started to do, put friends and, and conversation and relationship in my life, and after three and a half years of of this awful, dark marriage, it, it woke me up. And it was actually a pastor that I went to counseling for because I had this deep um, feeling of God is going to hate me if I divorce this man. He's going to hate me. And he looked at me in the eye, and this man of God who I had listened to for years, he looked at me in the eye and said, Becky, God doesn't hate you. He hates the pain that it causes his children. And that allowed me the freedom to get out of a very toxic, abusive relationship and to move forward. Um, and it was a very, a very tough time of my life. Um, and uh, you know, I was finally able to get out of that oppressive situation and start to heal. But that healing, you know, it, it wasn't instantaneous. Healing takes a long time. And I didn't realize, I guess, to the extent or the depth of the wounds of my heart. And, and some of that had started when I was younger with the brokenness of my home. And, and I've been in counseling for a very long time, and <laughs> finally which I think is a great thing. I'm finally getting to the point where I'm recognizing what those wounds and what those lies are. Um, a few years after that, I met Josh, and we married. And despite marrying this wonderful man of God, um, who actually was a man of God, and having two beautiful daughters, I found myself with a, a one-year-old and a three-year-old still almost more lonely and depressed than I'd ever been because I was trying to fill what only God could fill within my heart. Um, and, you know alcohol couldn't do it, right? Um, my husband couldn't do it. We did a lot of counseling and a lot of things we went through um, just because I was trying to fill that and him to heal me, but that's not what I needed. Exercise didn't do it. Work didn't do it. Um, and I read a, a book once, and it, it said something to the effect of that sometimes God has to take you to the end of yourself before he can truly start working in your life. And, and I guess I needed, I'm very stubborn, I needed that. <laughs> so um, when our daughter Elaine was four months old, she was hospitalized for over a month and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. And she almost didn't make it, but by the grace of God, she did. And, and that um, was a very traumatic time for both of us in our life. And in it, what it did is it kind of piqued my anxiety to a point where I was starting to be unable to cope with this anxiety and this stress in my heart. And right around that time, um, the Army took me to Fort Hood, Texas for a year, and I brought the girls with me. Um, Josh stayed here for his job in Rochester. So I was working um, as a single geographical parent with a one and three-year-old as full-time active duty. And it was very difficult. It was, it was the most difficult year of my life. And I got to the point where I wasn't sleeping. I had such bad anxiety and insomnia that I couldn't sleep. I couldn't. Um, I just couldn't really function, and so I had no choice but to reach out and get help. And that is when I started with the combination of, of intense counseling and, and anti-anxiety medication, started to be able to see clearly, you know, when you're not sleeping, and 
it's so hard to, to just think logically and to let God even work if you can't even see what's, what's right and what's wrong. And um, that began kind of the last three-year journey of where God has brought me through now. Um, so God started orchestrating a lot of people and conversations in my life during that time through counseling. Um, but we had come back to Rochester, and we, Josh and I, wanted to get involved in a church um, and find a community. So we moved north of the city to uh, get a community. Neither of us have family in, in the state, and so it was very important for us to get involved. But I had um, used kind of excuses throughout my my faith walk to get involved, you know, well, of course I was believing a lie that I wasn't good enough, right? That I wasn't worth God's love, that I wasn't worthy. So it was really easy to make excuses like, no one wants you to be in, in ministry, Becky, because you, you know, you're broken, right? You're divorced, you're, you're worthless, you're, you know, all of the lies that you can think of. And, and even some of them were humorous, like, I don't like scrapbooking and knitting, you know, I'm not a real normal Christian woman, I like kayaking and camping, so, like, these silly lies were things that kept me from being effective, so even though I was saved through this time, I wasn't, I wasn't free, I wasn't being used by God, I wasn't being effective, because I was so stuck within my own fear and anxiety, and in the last year and a half, two years, coming to Riverwood and coming to a different area through people, and I would love to share all of it, but I would be up here all day, <laughs> sharing how God orchestrated conversations and people to come into my life to speak truth into a heart that desperately needed truth and desperately needed to know that not only does God love me in a big sense, he loves and created me individually and specifically for a purpose. And that truth was not easy for me to accept. That truth is something I am still daily working to accept. Um, it is definitely a journey. It is a process. And the enemy is very tricky and very cunning. And I have been awakened in the last year to just how real Satan is and how um, he can destroy the effectiveness of believers in the body of Christ just by keeping us paralyzed with whatever it is you're struggling with, fear, anxiety, insecurity, you know, you name it. And that's where I was. I was just, I was paralyzed. And I can't, I can't pinpoint exactly when it was that God woke me up. Maybe my husband can, <laughs> but um, it, it was over a, a process where just one step toward truth and then another step toward truth to where all of a sudden I could see the lies for what they were. And kind of the pinnacle of it really was at the women's retreat. I had um, been really struggling with what I thought was anxiety and fear, but really it was rooted in shame. I felt ashamed and embarrassed of my past and shamed and embarrassed that I couldn't, I couldn't somehow get past myself and accept God's love for me. And I'm not a big crier, except for when I'm pregnant, but otherwise... Uh, at the retreat, like, I just couldn't turn off the waterworks, and I'm like, what is wrong with me? But it was God healing me in a way that I absolutely needed through wonderful sisters in Christ who loved me and accepted me, and they didn't care about the past, because guess what, Becky? Everybody has one. It just looks different. It just looks different, and it's the same God who's been faithful through it all. Um, and one of the verses that a friend gave to me that has kind of been a theme um, for my life and, and describes it. It's, it's from Zephaniah um, at chapter 3, and, and the context is kind of the future of Jerusalem, God's people, um, Israel. And I guess, you know, without getting too much in theology, we are, right? We're God's people, God's chosen people. In the verses 317, it's, The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. So I got at 19 that God is with me and that he's mighty to save. But it took me 15 years to realize that, yes, Becky, he will take great delight in you. And he does take great delight in me. And I am a beloved daughter of the King of Kings. Um, and he will rejoice over me with singing. And all I need to do is just turn to him and, and let it be. Um, so... <laughs> I guess what I want to share is that don't just settle for salvation. God wants so much more 
than that for every one of you. He wants you to be free. Um, and it is, it's tough. The last couple of years have been awful at times, to be honest. It's been pretty ugly. You can attest to that and a lot of times. Um, but it has been so beautifully freeing. And I would not take any of it back. And I am so thankful that God has brought me to where I am now and what he's done you know, in me, and hopefully my prayer now is he can use what I've gone through to help bring that freedom to others. So I don't know what that looks like, but I'm open to it for the first time in my life, and I'm just so thankful for this church and for these people here, and God is definitely among us. His spirit is here, and he is mighty to save. Thank you. Would you stand with us as we sing about the wonderful, mighty love of our God? Jealous for me, his love's like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory.
I'm going to be reading from Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 11. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. It was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man, and God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God, and it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God, who warned him about the things that, he, that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world, and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. And even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith, for he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child, though she was barren and was too old. She believed that God would keep his promise. And so a whole nation came from this one man who was as good as dead, a nation with so many people that like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, there is no way to count them. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who was invisible. It was by faith that Moses commanded the people of Israel to keep the Passover and to sprinkle blood on the doorposts so that the angel of death would not kill their firstborn sons. It was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. But when the Egyptians tried to follow, they were all drowned. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. All these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. But others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at and their backs were co cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stonings. Some were sawed in half and others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. Yet none of them received all that God had promised, for God had something better in mind for us, so that they would not reach perfection without us. Thank you, Bethany. And uh, Becky, when you uh, shared your story, which I really appreciated, I, uh, the words came to me, Oscar Wilde said, uh, every saint has a past, every sinner has a future. You know, we are um, uh, going to go to communion uh, shortly here. Uh, after last week, uh, someone asked a question after the message, and we always appreciate that when people are thinking. It was a good question, a, a provocative question, and I'll, I'll share that in a moment, but just sum up, we talked last week about, uh, about being inviting, you know, how, how God wants his house full, and we're to be inviting, and just summarize, that means inviting, in this case, both an adjective and a verb. To be inviting means to be, you know, welcoming, to be, 
to be warm, gracious, friendly. You know, that, those are qualities that we aspire to that by God's grace we'll have. And it's also a verb, a participle actually, because it's continual action that we uh, are inviting others, inviting them into our homes, inviting them out for lunch, inviting them uh, to church, to our connect group, small group, a men's or women's event, etc. And all these aims, and all these ultimately our aim is that people will, we're inviting them to a relationship with us, but through us with Jesus. Now, so anyways, the question from last Sunday was, uh, what about the Lord's table? What about communion? Shouldn't we be inviting everybody to partake of the Lord's Supper? Why wouldn't we want anyone present not to partake of the bread and cup? Now, again, good, fair, provocative question. And, and I, I think um, to answer that um, is helpful when we look at, uh, in Jesus' day, there were two different types of meals. Okay, uh, and, and dinners were not always private occasions like they are for us, where, um, you know, uh, you invite me over to your house for dinner, and I'm open after church today, uh, but uh, you can't all at once, so I'll line up my calendar. But anyways, I digress, don't I? Um, but they, they were not strictly limited to the invited guests. The, the, there were others who attended, who were welcome to attend. They would not partake at the table but they came to, to watch, to listen. Uh, that's not the way we do dinners nowadays, but they did it back then. One beautiful instance occurs in Luke chapter 7, the end of that chapter, where Jesus is invited to the home of a Pharisee named Simon, and a woman who was not a dinner guest, who was not eating of the meal, nevertheless was present there, and, and she sat at the feet of Jesus, and she, she wept profusely, and she, she washed his feet with her tears, and, and she poured perfume over his feet, and then she kissed his feet. It's, it's, it's a, a very moving. She didn't eat at the table, but was present. And there are other examples of that kind of uh, meal occurring uh, in Jesus' ministry in the Gospels. Then there was another type of meal, which was the Passover meal. And that's where the first communion, the first Lord's table occurred. It was actually part of Passover. It was a Seder meal, uh, which all the Jews celebrated during the Passover season. And Jesus did that with his disciples. And this annual meal appears to be a, a bit different from the other type of meal I just described. That was one where it appears to be for guests only. Uh, there is no mention of anyone else being present at the uh, Last Supper other than Jesus and his disciples. And, uh, you know, I, I think about that. There's a reason for that. Because Jesus said uh, he instructed his disciples to do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. The Lord's table is for those who remember what Jesus has done for them, that he gave his body, shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, thus, anyone who's received the forgiveness of sins through, through Jesus is welcome at the table of the Lord. And that means, for instance, one doesn't have to be a member of Riverwood Church to, to partake of the elements here. Anyone who has received the gift of forgiveness of sins, is welcome to partake. But here's where it, it's a little, uh, there's a nuance here, I'd say. Um, if someone says, no, I don't believe in Jesus, well, you know, they are welcome to be present uh, in our worship service anytime, and, and as we, um, including at the Lord's table, as we celebrate, as we observe it. But in that case, I'd say it'd be better for the individual to refrain from partaking of the elements since they themselves are not remembering and celebrating what Jesus has done for them. But, and here's what I think is really cool. Um, in the Gospels, there are several instances of people coming to faith at meals where Jesus was in attendance. Like the woman, like this woman here, who washed her feet, uh, uh, who rather washed the, the feet of Jesus and, and kissed them and put perfume on uh, her, his feet. Jesus said to woman, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. Maybe you are like that woman. It, today could be the day in which you come to faith. A meal that before wouldn't have been yours is yours now. It, it means like her, you know that you're a sinner. I mean, God loves sinners like her. God loves sinners like me. God loves sinners like you. God loves us so much that he gives one and only son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And the Bible says several things. It says, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. 
you will become a child of God. You're part of the family of God, and you are, are welcome at the table of the Lord. And now, if, if and perhaps, you know, you're not ready for that, and, and that's okay. Then God still loves you, and so do we, and you're so welcome to be present with us. Better in that case not to receive the elements yet. But right now, you can put your faith in Christ. And I'm, what I'd like to do is just give you a moment of silence now in the quiet of your heart. You can say to God something like these words. The words aren't important. It's the attitude. But you can say something like, Jesus, thank you for loving me so much that you gave your son to die on the cross for my sin. I repent of my sin. I receive your forgiveness. Come into my life. Make me into a new person. Just... If, if that's your heart, we're just going to take a moment of silence and you say that to God. You know, if you've done that, Jesus said, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Uh, That means, among so much more, but that means you're most certainly welcome to come to the table of the Lord, even this morning. Revelation 22, 17, we read, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. Let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. So now I invite you to come to the Lord's table. We have two stations. You can go on this side and this side. Um, I receive the elements, bring them back to your seat, commune with God, meditate while the worship team is singing the song and everyone else picks up their elements and then we'll partake of them together. So I invite you to come now.
Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. We remember something we must never forget, that God loves us, that Jesus died for us, and that we're his children. That love will never fail us, never leave us. And we love one another, we do it together. And he said, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let me once more but it's going to be real short. I just wanted to give you an update on the search committee and our search for a new lead pastor. Uh, we've just finalized the um, job description, so it's going to be advertised a position this week. We're going to be advertising with Converge here on our website, and then we've got about 20 or 30 um, other places, uh, schools and stuff that we're going to be advertising. So anyways, if you see some of the search committee, um, just say thank you to them. Uh, they put in a lot of hours that come here before service uh, most weeks. Uh, we had a four-hour meeting with Converge and the elders about a month ago uh, in an evening. So I just uh, want to thank, thank the people that are on the search committee. It's a completely volunteer thing, and they put in so much time. So, But uh, hopefully, uh, I think it's about six or eight weeks the job posting will be out. So thanks. Oh, and Jerry's going to pray for us now. Is this on? It is. Well, Becky, we're all in the same boat. We're all we're all underway. We are all learning and growing. We're all at different stages, and we all need the Lord. As for me, at age eight, I heard a radio story about people in the depth of despair and realized that I also needed God. At age 16, we moved from the farm to, the, to town 
and I began attending church. <clears throat> At age 25, as I watched my father dying, I realized I knew nothing about prayer. I only knew the Lord's Prayer and Table Grace. At age 40, I was thinking of my unworthiness to take on a ministry role I had been asked to lead. When the Lord said to me, I was only thinking it, not even praying. And the Lord said to me, what do you mean you're not worthy? What about Peter? What about Paul? I realized that Peter had denied Christ three times and that Paul had persecuted Christians. So I realized it was not about me. My job is only to listen and obey. The Lord once wakened me in the middle of the night to pray for two hours for a man I barely knew. Paul wrote, Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. He also wrote to Timothy, God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and self-discipline. And James wrote, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. And in the book of Acts, the apostles had been hauled before the religious leaders and told to shut up, not to, not to preach in the name of Jesus. But they prayed. They said, Lord, consider their threats and enable our, your servants to speak your word with great boldness, stretching out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of of your Holy Spirit, your servant Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, everyone here is in need of your prayer. Every one of us. We are all, we all come up short every day. But Lord, we look forward to all you plan to accomplish today in and around and through us. <clears throat> Thank you for cleansing us from all those things which hinder your work within us and allow us to be filled with your spirit so full that it pours out and floods everyone around us that it is your spirit that touches the hearts of all we come in contact with. Thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you for all those that have need for healing. All of us are ailing at one time or another, and some are in desperate need of healing right now. <clears throat> Thank you for healing. Thank you for forgiving our sins. For those of us that, that were here today that had sins in, in, our, in our heart, we needed to confess. Thank you for forgiving them. And thank you for giving your blood that we might be freed. Thank you for those who are being oppressed here and around the world. There's oppression that is deeper than I've ever seen in my lifetime. <clears throat> People are dying because they confess you, Lord, and they community around them hates them. Thank you, Lord, for our pastors. Thank you for flooding them with your grace and mercy and peace and filling them with wisdom and understanding and the ability to teach and lead. Thank you, Lord, for our government leaders. Lift up those who will serve you and take down those who will not. And let your will be done in every government agency around this country. Thank you for the search committee 
they're working hard to find the candidate that you have already picked out. Thank you for leading them to that candidate that they might be successful in inviting that one here to be a candidate on site so that we might all see and hear and rejoice. Thank you for our worship team. Sunday after Sunday, they lead us in worship. And it's like we are just an extension of your heavenly chambers, singing in tune with the, with the angels of heaven. Thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Seems like our projector gave up for our last song. But it's a familiar song. It's Goodness of God. Uh, so stand with us as we close with Goodness of God. Um, it's a familiar song. You guys know this song, right? Yeah?
today and it's in Ephesians chapter 3 but starting at verse 20 it says now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever amen, amen. all God's people said amen, <laughs> amen. if you need prayer uh, Mark and Celeste will be over here to my right Otherwise, we look forward to seeing all of your faces next week.